Um, Simon, uh, I started to introduce you earlier and you had to leave, but here you are again. Please, if you would take the floor. Thank you. Peter, thank you very much. Um, it's very good to be with you. I was just reflecting as I was looking around the room that um, you're very patient people. <laughs> you're very long suffering. <laughs> yes. And some of you and some of you have aged very gracefully over all the years I've been meeting with you. Thank you, sir. I'm sorry we've had to meet so often in these sorts of contexts, but I'm very happy to be one of the people uh, welcoming you here this evening. And I am very conscious after, again, uh, my Greek Cypriot friends have made longer speeches and listened to longer speeches than probably any other group of friends I've ever known. So I will try not to repeat what colleagues have said except in two respects, and I just want to add a couple of other reflections. You are spared by the fact that at nine o'clock uh, the speeches must end, so and I'm conscious another colleague may want to work. Uh, with other colleagues, I've been very preoccupied in recent months here by two other conflicts in two other parts of the world. One is in Israel and Palestine, and one is in Sri Lanka. And both have produced uh, terrible deaths and uh, terrible violence and terrible injury. Uh, Andy and I, for example, only yesterday and today have been talking again about Sri Lanka and seeing if we can get some wisdom in the government of Sri Lanka for the minority community in Sri Lanka, the Tamil community. And in Sri Lanka, as in Cyprus, we have been arguing all the time that there should continue to be one state, but one state where everybody has the right to self-governance and freedom and that the basic rights apply. But the world doesn't always come to that solution. The world sometimes signs up to accepting the result of what has been forced on a country. When uh, Britain withdrew its responsibility from the Indian subcontinent, it left Pakistan in two parts, East and West Pakistan. And then there was a civil war, and now, as you know, there is not a one-state solution for Pakistan. There is a two-state solution. It's Pakistan and Bangladesh. And in the Middle East, again, a British former responsibility. We haven't done very well around the world, I have to say, if you look back on the legacy of British occupation in leaving peaceful and calm and well-ordered arrangements. And the Middle East is another poor example. But there, the debate is all about a two-state solution. It could perfectly easily be a one-state solution. Because actually on the ground, Muslims and Jews and Christians uh, and Arabs and Jews often get on very well in villages and communities. And so there's no obvious logic that there has to be a one-state solution or a two-state solution in any part of the world. It doesn't follow <laughs> just because it's an island, it must be a one-state solution. And just because it's mainland, uh, part of a bigger continent, it's a two-state solution. So these things always have to be battled for and fought for. And I've never wavered, Peter, as you know, in my view. Uh, influenced by having been, influenced by having had family living in Cyprus, influenced by the views of my parents about justice and the history before, that the best solutions for Cyprus is a one-state solution. Because <coughs> The people of Cyprus, the Greek Cypriots and the Turkish Cypriots, have been able to get on well and work together and be in communities together in North and South. And so I continue to work for that, as you do. And I'm encouraged, because although there have been terrible, terrible disappointments, the very fact that now there are regular, consistent and ongoing negotiations between two people who get on well, and like each other, and know each other well, is actually the most encouraging thing you can have. Relationships, in the end, in politics, are more important than all the diplomacy in the world. If people get on well and can do business together, then there's a chance of progress. Now, the trouble with delivering is that, of course, every two minutes along the way, there are democratic accountabilities to uh, take account of. There are about to be local elections in Turkey this month. So you're not going to obviously have Turkish parties and the Turkish Prime Minister 
that was president as well, saying things that are going to be very sympathetic to the other side of the Turkish election. And then, of course, next month we have elections in Northern Cyprus, local elections, parliamentary elections, as they call them. So we're probably going to have a bit of a difficult two months, March and April. But I sincerely believe that the opportunity is still great after that. <laughs> and the best opportunity we probably ever have is coming in the months ahead, once the next two months are over. For a combination of three reasons, two of which have been touched on. I'm not naive about this. I don't believe that people are there. I don't believe it's all sorted. And I don't believe that there's not a lot of hard work to go. But the three things that I think militate in favour are firstly, there is a European election this year for the European Parliament. And you do have a huge responsibility, as do other uh, Cypriots across Europe, to put the issue of Cyprus in the minds of people standing and elected in June to the European Parliament, and then to make sure that they put it on the agenda of the new members of the Commission who will be appointed probably this year, but it might be deferred to election because of the Irish referendum, which is going to happen again. It may get put back. <coughs> so that's an option. And you do, I, please, I, I absolutely implore you to make sure you go to all the people who declare their candidacy and all the parties, and don't forget it's a list system, it's a proportional system, so you need to speak to the people at the top of the list and get them in London and be able to sign. Secondly, the new administration in the States is, I think, a potential <coughs> ally. Now, I remember, and Tom was right to remind us, typical Tom type way, uh, that we've had terrible disappointments from the States. And they have not delivered. And they often don't deliver because they have their eyes on other balls. But they have the potential, they have the capacity. And the states have to be party to this because they're the only people who can really speak with strength. They're one of two groups of people to speak with strength to Turkey. And therefore we have to work really hard on your friends and families in the states. And we have to work really hard on our government to engage the American administration, to engage the president and the secretary of state in the states and the advisors. And a lot of us need to do a lot of work this year when we go to the states and when we talk to the uh, ministers who come here, members of the administration, to make sure it's on their agenda too, so that they can also be part of the peace process. And the third uh, reason for the opportunity is that um, <coughs> there are, for Turkey, uh, opportunities that they are still actively pursuing. There has been movement in <coughs> Turkey. They are seeking to accommodate the demands of the European Union. My judgment is that that could stall, that it could, the heat could go off, that the prospect of Turkey joining could recede, that they could give up on that, and that the European Union could give up on them. It is in everybody's interest, I take a different view from you, it's in everybody's interest that Turkey is incentivized to become part of the European Union, in my view, uh, because a part of Turkey is in Europe, and because actually it would add a Muslim voice in Europe, which would be helpful to the credibility of Europe in its negotiations around the world. But those negotiations also are at a critical time, and this year there will be lots of detailed discussion. So there are three reasons why things could potentially go well. As I say, putting the next two months aside, which I think would be difficult. <coughs> I think our job is to make sure, as parliamentarians, there will be an election by June next year, is to make sure, as Tom and others have indicated, that we, as Britain, keep on putting enough pressure that the Foreign Secretary of the day and the Prime Minister and the Ministers of the Foreign Office understand their historic responsibility as a guarantor power, as a fellow Commonwealth nation, as a former colonial governor, to be the lead party that delivers. Because if we don't push, if our government doesn't push, if we don't see it as our responsibility, then to be honest, we can't expect the Americans or the European Union or anybody else to.